Good Monday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Lindsay Reiser in for Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, massacre at the mall. Overnight, a vigil for the victims of the second mass shooting in Texas in just a week. Eight people were killed. Several others hurt when a gunman opened fire at an outlet mall near Dallas. What we're learning about the frightening moments as hundreds of shoppers took cover. Plus, what investigators are learning about the suspected gunman this morning. Another tragedy in Texas, this time near the Mexican border. Police say a car drove into a crowd outside a migrant shelter, killing eight people. The new information coming in about the man behind the wheel. Plus, the latest on the surge of migrants at the border as officials get ready to lift Title 42 restrictions this week. Also this morning, thank a teacher. Today kicks off Teacher Appreciation Week, a time to recognize all those hardworking educators who often feel underappreciated and underpaid. The U.S. Education Sec Secretary and the 2023 Teacher of the Year will join us this hour with what they want people to remember this week and what can be done to address issues like teacher shortages and pay. Plus, speak now, Taylor. Superstar Taylor Swift announces she's releasing another re-recorded album the 2010 hit Speak Now. We'll show you how she dropped the surprise on fans this weekend, plus what to expect from the new recordings, as Taylor once again gets to call this album the best thing that's ever been mine. I feel like Savannah should be here. We it, well, she was like at that. Taylor last night, there which is go. why she's not here this morning, <laughs> so we'll hear more later this week. All right, we are going to shift gears, though, and start with those developments on two tragedies we're following out of Texas. Yeah, let's start with the latest on that deadly mass shooting at a mall near Dallas, Texas, on Saturday. Eight people were killed, seven others were hurt. Police identified the gunman as 33-year-old Mauricio Garcia. He was shot and killed by a, poli a police officer who was already at the mall on an unrelated call. Now, we do want to warn you, some of the video you're about to see is difficult to watch. We are not going to show anyone being struck by gunfire. Now, police are reviewing this video very closely. It shows the moment the gunman jumped out of his car and opened fire on innocent shoppers. Investigators say he was armed with an assault-style rifle and a handgun, and that he was wearing a tactical vest. They say he also had more weapons and ammunition in his car. It's still so traumatic to talk about. I, I can yeah. imagine that. Can't it was imagine. on the news this morning. And I mean, it, you know, innocent people lose their lives on the count of, you know, one some, person with a gun. I've never in my entire life encountered anything like this. This is. It's like a movie that, that's, you know, you're part of and you know it's not happening, it's real. From around all this, we are joined by NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson, who is in Allen, Texas. Priscilla, good morning to you. I mean, this all happened very quickly. So explain how it all unfolded and what is the latest on the investigation? Yeah, Joe, good morning. And as you heard there, people are still in shock and disbelief. Those who were here and witnessed or experienced all of this unfolding. And all of the witnesses say that this came out of nowhere. They were enjoying a Saturday afternoon shopping when all of a sudden, as you saw in that dash cam video, someone pulls up to the mall, gets out of the car and just starts firing. And to give you a bit of context, this is an outdoor outlet mall. We're talking about more than 100 stores. So there may have been certainly hundreds, if not thousands of people that were milling about this mall as the shooter went on this rampage here. We know that there was an officer who was already on scene for a different call that immediately ran towards that gunfire and was able to ultimately shoot and kill that suspect. But it's unclear at this point how much time had passed, how much time where there was shooting going on. But obviously we know that in that time there were eight people who were murdered and seven more who were were injured. And as for the latest in the investigation, police have not held a briefing in more than 24 hours. They are revealing very little information in terms of the investigation and how all of this unfolded. Instead, right now, they are asking anyone with videos or who may have been witnesses to this to continue to come forward as they try to piece together a TikTok of how all of this played out here on Saturday. Joe? So, Priscilla, even though investigators are at least publicly a little bit tight lipped, we are learning more about the shooter. What can you tell? Tell us about what we've learned about Mauricio Garcia. 
Yeah, so they have identified him as a 33 year old male and senior law enforcement officials tell us that they are looking at investigating this crime as something that could have been racially or ethnically motivated. We know that senior law enforcement officials say they have seen hundreds of social media posts from this suspect that is espousing uh, neo-Nazi uh, rhetoric and also white supremacist rhetoric. Officials say that he interacted with that type of content online and they did search his family home uh, overnight on Saturday. We went out there and spoke to some neighbors to see what they knew of this suspect, if there were any red flags. I want to play a little bit of some of those conversations. From what I've seen of the guy, I mean, I didn't, I did, I didn't see any red flags that described uh, what what he had, you know, apparently been uh, said that they had done. He went to high school with some of the neighbors, and they just said he was just always very quiet. And the sense I got from speaking to those neighbors is that people would say hello in passing, but didn't really seem to know him. And I should point out that police, while they are investigating the white supremacist neo-Nazi themes here, they have not specified a motive as they are continuing to uh, investigate this case. They've also not said how the shooter obtained all of those weapons. Joe? And quickly, Priscilla, what are we learning about some of the victims here? Yeah, so police have not identified the victims publicly, but we are beginning to hear from some of the family members of those uh, eight who were killed, including 20-year-old uh, Christian LaCour is among the victims. His grandmother posting on Facebook that he was a security guard at the mall, that he had big plans for his future. She called him a beautiful soul and said that this tragedy had just has just been unbearable on his family. And we're also learning the name of a second victim, Ash Warren. Mara Thadi Konda, an Indian woman who worked as an engineer here. We actually spoke with a nonprofit group that was on the ground yesterday trying to verify whether she was among the victims because her family in India had not been able to get in touch with her. And we have now confirmed that she is among the victims. And also, in addition to those eight that were killed, there were seven who were injured. We know that six of them remain hospitalized, three in critical condition, including children aging from five years old to 61 years old. Joe. All right. We are thinking of all of them. Priscilla Thompson. Priscilla, thank you. For more now, we are joined by Deshaun McDaniel, who was an eyewitness to the attack. Deshaun, thank you so much for being here. We are so sorry um, that this is happening in your community and you're having to deal with all of this. Um, first of all, just want to ask you how you how you're doing. It's still just surreal right now. Um, trying to stay strong through like processing all the information, but. Yeah, it's just a matter of like staying strong and uh, it keeps hitting you that it's real. It's like how most people keep saying it was a dream. It feels like a dream. That's what it feels like until you keep seeing your the things that you see every day on the news. You're like, dude, that's real. Alan and, uh, you know, the common things that you pass by every day. So it just keeps hitting you, hitting you, hitting you over and over. Take us back to Saturday um, as much as you can here. Where were you and what happened when you realized something was wrong? What did you see? What did you do? It, it was crazy because before we got to the Allen Mall, like uh, the outlet mall, my boxing coach, he was a Marine and he was texting me about someone um, in a different case that was planning a, a shooting. So he kind of sparked that, in that, that thought process in my mind before I even got there. So I was there with my wife and my three daughters and uh, as we were shopping, I kept reminding my daughters, like, hey, look up from your phone, stay alert, right? Um, pay attention to your surroundings. Wow. Make sure you know what's going on around you. And that, that energy was with me the whole entire time. So it's just crazy that it ended up being that way. And then as we were shopping, I was feeling the urge to leave. So we were there a shorter shopping trip than we usually are. I was mm. the whole time, I'm like, yeah, let's just leave. Let's, let's, let's shop another time. Right. So as we um, are exiting and we see the police officer that end up stopping the, the shooter, um, we're right next to the to the police officer and we end up leaving. My daughter wanted to go get ice cream from the shopping place uh, at the outlet. And we told her, like, let's go to the gas station. We could just get ice cream from the gas station. It's a little cheaper. And with doing that, we just escaped the shooting maybe by like one or two minutes. 
So it was just surreal that everything that led up to us leaving saved, ended up saving our life because we was in the same spots that I'm seeing on the news where the other people got shot. We were in that same spots. And it's just crazy that if one thing changed, it could have been us right there. I'm so sorry that you and your kids had to go through that. Obviously thankful you're all okay. But now that you've had, I mean, really just a day and a half to sort of process, and of course the, the, the process will be much longer than that, but what do you want people to know? Uh, this, to just stay alert because like, Allen is supposed to be one of the safest towns, right? So as most of us, and as we're shopping, we, we have this in mind, we have this, this uh, natural feeling of being safe, nothing to worry about. But like I was saying, stay alert. I was always alert. My boxing coach trained us to stay alert. He was a Marine. He always put this in, put it in our mind. So anywhere you at, no matter how safe it's supposed to be, to just stay alert because anything could happen, you know? Deshaun McDaniel, thank you so much for your time. Glad you're okay. Thank you. Now to the other tragedy out of Texas that we are following this morning. At least eight people were killed and nearly a dozen others were injured when a driver plowed into a bus stop on Sunday. It happened outside of a shelter for migrants in the border town of Brownsville. That town and many others have seen an influx of migrants ahead of the expected expiration of a COVID era border restriction, Title 42. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas has more. The horrific aftermath on the streets of Brownsville, Texas, just miles from the southern border. After police say a man plowed his car into a group of pedestrians waiting at a bus stop. A gray Land Rover uh, disregarded a red light and ran over several individuals standing at a bus stop across the street from our local homeless shelter. The shelter is a partner of Catholic Charities. They were all from Venezuela. They were all young men that had already uh, uh, been there for a day or two and, and had contacted their families and had already bought their tickets to travel. And they were enthusiastic about uh, being here already in the United States and, and they're ready to go to meet their family. Law enforcement officials telling NBC News the suspect, a Hispanic male, rammed into the crowd with his vehicle. Police say he has been arrested and charged with reckless driving, and they're investigating whether this was an intentional act. Just days earlier, Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas announced a new temporary processing center nearby to help with the anticipated migrant surge in the area. Already, thousands are gathering at the southern border ahead of the Biden administration's lifting of Title 42 on Thursday, a COVID-era policy that restricted the number of migrants entering the country. But the Biden administration's new immigration policies may be even stricter. None of that is stopping the migrants in hope of a better life. All right, Quad, thank you for that report. The FBI is helping out with the investigation. Officials say the driver is being uncooperative. They are running toxicology reports to see if he had been drinking as they try to figure out a motive. Turning now to the latest on the civil rape case against former President Donald Trump. As part of this case, Trump has been sued for battery and defamation, and we now know Trump will not testify in his own defense after a deadline assigned by the judge came and went, and it comes after both sides rested their cases. Writer E. Jean Carroll accuses Trump of raping her in a department store in the mid-90s. The former president has continued to deny those allegations. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas joins us now. So, Danny, good morning. The judge gave Trump's lawyers until 5 p.m. last night to let him know if Trump wanted to testify. They did not make any such filing. What do you think is the strategy behind that? He could have given him another month, and it never would have happened. The reality is this is that Trump was never going to testify. It was, whether he realized it or not, it's really just a troll that would have gotten the plaintiff's attorneys to do an extra night of work prepping for a cross-examination that even they knew was not likely to come. But in reality, it might not have even been as thought out as that. It may have just been some random comments by Trump on a golf course that set everyone else spinning, including his own defense team. But I imagine his own defense team knew he was never going to show up and testify because the risk was simply too great. Far better to let them read into the evidence, the deposition transcripts. And by the way, uh, how helpful were those for Trump? Not very much. So it gives you a good idea of how, uh, how well he would have acquitted himself had he taken the stand live uh, in real time. Let's go ahead and show some of the taped deposition of Donald Trump that was shown to the jury. I don't even know who the woman, let's say, I don't know who, 
It's Marla. You're saying Marla's in this photo? That's Marla, yeah. That's, that's my wife. Which one, woman are you pointing to? No. That's Here. Carol. Oh, is that? The oh, person okay. you just pointed to was oh, Eugene Carroll. Who is that? Who is this? Point, your wife. And the person, the woman on the right is your then wife, I don't Ivana? know. This was the picture. Ivana. I assume that's John Johnson. Is that that's Carol? Carol? All right, everybody, we're going to show the same photo that Trump was looking at. Danny, what are your thoughts on that moment? I think, and maybe I'm overthinking this, that this is Trump's approach to a deposition. He's the I don't know nothing guy, and that's kind of a character that you'll find a lot in depositions, the person who just doesn't know anything. It's consistent with his theme of I don't know anything about this because it didn't happen. So it's his way of somewhat being unhelpful and not knowing anything and looking at a picture and saying, but I don't know, is that... Who is that? Is that uh, Waldo? Is that uh, the plaintiff? I have no idea who's here. I don't know nothing about anything. And I think it's a, a, a kind of a cultivated attitude in these legal cases that he thinks will help him. But what he probably didn't realize is that by doing that, he set himself up for people saying, well, if you say that person is not your type and you mistook her for your wife, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm, all right, Danny Savals, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you. Time for a check on your morning news now weather forecast. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us now with a look at your week ahead. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning to you both. So good to see you. And it is a unsettled start to the work week. We're looking at stormy start. We're looking at some uh, storms in portions of the Ohio Valley into the mid middle Mississippi Valley. And that's going to be the case as we go throughout this Monday. We have a frontal boundary that's draped from the mid-Atlantic all the way to the southern plains. And you can see some rain falling right now, some heavy rain falling throughout portions of the Midwest, the Tennessee Valley, where you see those brighter colors. That's where we're seeing the heaviest rain falling. So this is a setup here. There's that frontal boundary I was just talking about, stretching all all the way to the plains, we're seeing isolated risks for flooding from Wisconsin to Louisiana with really heavy rainfall. And in the southern plains, we could see up to four inches of rain over the next couple of days. So then by tomorrow, heavy rain developing in southeast Texas. That severe weather threat does continue in the southern plains. So we have the threat today, also tomorrow into Wednesday as well, as we're going to see that risk continuing on Wednesday. This is what it looks like today for the severe weather risk. 17 million people at risk for winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail. It could be large, and also a few tornadoes are possible. It's kind of feeding off the moisture from the Gulf. It's really warm, so we're going to see that cold front interacting with that warm air, and that's going to spark the chance for those storms, especially where you see the yellow. So places like St. Louis, Indianapolis, Lexington, Paducah, even just north of Nashville, we could see some strong storms. Into the Southern Plains, that will be the case as well. And then we're looking at the chance for heavy rain. Notice in parts of Oklahoma, into Texas, some really dark colors. That's where we're we're expecting heavy rain falling over the next few days. Dallas, you are uh, looking at the chance for some heavy rain as well as Houston down to Corpus Christi. So we do a, have a flooding, flood, flooding risk, excuse me, but we have a flash flooding risk as well. So where you see the blue, that's where we're expecting the highest amounts of rain falling and the chance for some flooding as well. Tuesday, the severe weather threat uh, impacts 5 million people, damaging hail, again, large hail, winds gusting over 60 miles per hour, a few tornadoes, and then heavy rain falling. And we could see hail even up to tennis ball size. We saw that yesterday in spots, and we could see that once again on Tuesday. The flash flood risk includes portions of the northern plains, the central plains, into parts of the southern plains. So San Antonio, Houston, Laredo, you could see the risk for flash flooding. It's really warm, too. We're looking at summer-like air in parts of the southern plains, 90 degrees today in Little Rock. That's 11 degrees above normal for this time of year. San Angelo, near 100 degrees. And we're going to see this warm air moving to the east as we go throughout the next couple of days. Back to you both. All right, summer in May. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate yeah. it. Sure. All right, coming up, a lot of us can remember a teacher, maybe more than one, who had a really big impact on our lives. In honor of Teacher Appreciation Week, we're going to talk to the Secretary of Education and this year's Teacher of the Year, what they have to say about the challenges of staff shortages, changing curriculum and burnout, plus their message to educators next.
It is Teacher Appreciation Week. It is a time to celebrate our nation's educators and the vital role they play in children's education. We were both talking in the break about teachers who made an impact in our lives. Yes, we all have at least one, if not many ones. But the challenges teachers must overcome have only grown more challenging. In recent years, teachers have had to navigate everything from staff shortages to a nationwide drop in test scores to all the troubles tied to the pandemic, including teacher burnout. So we want to take some time to talk about those challenges and also recognize teachers across the country, thanking them for everything they do. Joining us now to help us do that is Education Secretary Dr. Miguel Cardona and also Rebecca Peterson, who is the 2023 National Teacher of the Year. Good morning to both of you. Thank you for joining us for this important conversation. Secretary, I, Mr. Secretary, I'd like to begin with you because I want to know what message you would like to send to our nation's educators on this Teacher Appreciation Week and what is the best way we can all celebrate and honor our teachers? Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. And Rebecca is such a wonderful representative of the entire profession. She's amazing. I got a chance to meet her and her family last week. Look, to the educators that are watching, uh, we see you. We recognize that celebrating teachers is more than having coffee in the teacher's lounge during this amazing week. But it's also fighting for your agency, for better working conditions, and for competitive salary, which is what you deserve. And that's what we're doing uh, in D.C. Uh, for our educators. Everyone knows a teacher that has changed their lives. It's time that we lift up the profession and support our teachers. Secretary, on that note, we, we are seeing teacher shortages in schools across the country. A lot of that is being blamed on underfunding teacher burnout. And there are some proposals, some lawmakers want to do things like minimum salaries, of course, pay increases, bonuses. Is there support for incentives like that? And what else needs to be done? Yeah, there is support, you know, not enough support. Unfortunately, we're also uh, seeing uh, attacks on curriculum, attacks on the profession. Uh, but there is support for that. Uh, we're certainly supporting in our pr proposed budget uh, dollars to make sure we're incentivizing the profession, creating pathways from high school to college to the classroom. Um, you know, everything starts with a good educator in the classroom, regardless of curriculum or you know, schools don't function without strong teachers and uh, we need to make sure we're investing in teachers. Secretary Cardona, you know, a report out just last week showed U.S. history scores, they're the lowest recorded in nearly 30 years. That follows declines in reading and math scores. We're seeing this debate around the country, debates over what we should talk about and whether to avoid talking about some of the darker parts of American history. What do you think is behind this decline? Is it concerning to you that we're seeing this trend in history scores? Well, number one, it's concerning to me that the student performance is where it is. We have to do better. Our students deserve better. And we have a pathway to get there. We are uh, discussing raising the bar at the Department of Education. We have a plan to do that. But we see that we need to stop uh, this revisionist history or attacks on uh, curriculum or history because it doesn't align with what some people want uh, our students to learn uh, and, and erase uh, parts of our history. Unfortunately, that's become a hot button issue in many places. And we have to make sure that it, you could have the best curriculum, but if you're not uh, hiring highly qualified teachers, it doesn't matter. It's not going to go forward. Look, there, we know what to do. We're uh, proposing in our budgets and in our guidance how to support the profession, how to lift it up. Our students deserve better. Um, the, the data that came out in the recent uh, uh, civics uh, tests and even the nation's report card uh, it shows that we really need to focus on supporting our schools, having highly qualified teachers, and making sure that we're giving our educators and families an opportunity to engage in good instruction around topics that matter. Literacy, numeracy, and history are critically important for the success of students. Rebecca, let's go ahead and bring you in here. Congratulations on being named the 2023 Teacher of the Year. I mean, this is your 14th year in education. What does it mean to you to receive an honor like this? And how has your job changed over those past 14 years? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Mr. Secretary. It's so good to see you again as well. What a joy it is to represent this profoundly impactful and powerful profession that I, I just hold so dear. I, I always want to make clear that I wasn't chosen, I wasn't selected because I'm the best teacher. There's no such thing as the best teacher. There's an infinite number of ways to be highly effective, right? And so my hope this year is just to act as a sort of mirror, right? I hope that my colleagues 
um, resonate with a piece of me or my story or my classroom. Um, but ultimately what science has taught us is that mirrors reflect light. And there's just so much light all across our country through our teachers in their classrooms. And I hope that I can reflect that light and spread their message even further. Rebecca, you've used your platform as Teacher of the Year to create the Teachers of Oklahoma campaign. That's where you actually visit teachers across the state, highlight the great work that they're doing. Tell us more about this campaign, why it's so important. Yeah, thank you for that. Yes, as Oklahoma Teacher of the Year this past year, I had the joy of working on a passion project. And so I launched this project called Teachers of Oklahoma, kind of like Humans of New York. And I logged <laughs> over 20,000 miles driving to teachers' schools, watching them in their natural habitats of the classroom and just leaning into their work. And then I write about the good and important work that I see them and their students doing and publish it on social media and in print. And I think um, just telling teachers stories and listening to teachers stories is vital now more than ever. You know, teachers hold story after story, year after year. And so my hope here in, in telling their stories is that the rest of us hold, hold them as well and, and hold their stories also. And Rebecca, you wrote an open letter to your fellow educators and you talk about the challenges that teachers are facing post pandemic. What are some of those challenges? Yeah, there's, there's a few. Um, the one that I think is is piercing our hearts most is our students cry for mental health care, right? Their cry for mental <laughs> health care, particularly as a high school teacher, it's piercing my heart, piercing my colleague's heart. Um, we know we have research showing that our students' brains have literally changed post pandemic, right? And so that's very sobering, very sobering news. So now more than ever, I think it's incumbent upon us to not just have best practices for our academic contents, but also best practices for teaching the whole child, for teaching social and emotional learning as well. The research is sobering, but the science is also really clear. And the good news is that connection is how we heal. So now more than ever, we have to teach connection. What a great message. Rebecca Peterson, Teacher of the Year and Education Secretary, Dr. Miguel Cardona, thank you for joining us for this important conversation on Teacher Appreciation Week. Thanks so much for having us. Man, teachers do a lot. They do. All right, turning now to international news, we are going to start with some serious flooding in the Democratic Republic of Congo. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and other world headlines. Claudio, good morning. Joe Lindsay, good morning. Yes, according to local officials, the death toll uh, from floods in Congo rose to at least 401 since rivers broke their banks last week due to torrential rain sweeping away entire villages in the South Kivu province. Another official said thousands of people remain missing while the search and rescue operation is hampered by the damage caused by the floods to main roads. Now let's go to Canada, where throughout the weekend, tens of wildfires had forced thousands of people to evacuate. Officials in Alberta said more than 100 fires broke out since Saturday in the western part of the country. Now on Sunday, some cooler temperatures and a bit of rain brought some relief, but officials warned the blazes could grow bigger in the next days due to high winds. And finally, China's state media reported that an experimental Chinese spacecraft returned to Earth on Monday after staying in orbit 276, 276 days. The unmanned spacecraft was launched in August 2022, but its mission has largely remained under wraps. State media said the tests mark an important breakthrough in China's research into reusable spacecraft technology that will make future space missions more convenient and inexpensive, guys. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, a new way to help the homeless community. We are going to show you how the simple message of love your neighbor is helping people get off the streets in one major city and how it can help other cities combat the growing homelessness crisis. Stay with us. Well, it was a historic weekend in the UK as King Charles III and Queen Camilla were crowned Saturday at London's Westminster Abbey, the first coronation in the UK in 70 years. God save the king! God save the king! The momentous occasion marked with shouts of God save the king, as you heard there, as the Archbishop of Canterbury placed the crown on the king's head before the royal procession 
went back to Buckingham Palace. And joining us right now to discuss is author of New Royals and Royal Editor at Vanity Fair, Katie Nickel. Katie, good morning. Thanks for being with us. I mean, for the most dramatic part of the day, the anointing, King Charles was actually hidden from view. So walk us through what happened, some of the moments we didn't see, and, and what were some of the moments we did see that stood out for you? Well, I think that moment that you just mentioned was was such an important moment, that anointing with the holy oil from Jerusalem, which is steeped in, well, such an ancient tradition, it goes back to the Old Testament. You had this amazing combination of a sort of medieval ceremony with all the touches of a, of a modern king, which give us an indication of the king he, he's going to want to be, but the images that you're showing now are of this beautiful screen that was erected around the king as he was anointed. Now, we weren't sure whether we were going to see this moment, if you compare that to 1953, the last coronation, the queen was beneath a canopy. You could actually see much more of the queen being anointed than you could of Charles. But he wanted this moment to be an absolutely sacred moment between him and God. And I have to say, I think that was the right thing to do. I think it was incredibly powerful. There were so many wonderful images um, and have been so many amazing images of this whole weekend um, to have seen the regalia up so close and, and, and the sparkling crowns and the scepter and the orb. I mean, it, it was, well, it was majesty. That's the one word I think we can use to sum up the entire weekend. And um, when I reflect on the Prince of Wales's words at last night's concert at Windsor, which was another feast for the eyes, another sort of piece of wonderful theatre, he said, coronations are a declaration of our hopes for the future. That was what the late Queen said. And I think they're, they're very apt words because as we look at these historic images, this is our first king and queen since 1937. Um, it is a moment in history. 20 million people tuned in to watch this ceremony, this pageant, a military procession, the likes of which, well, I've been doing this job for 20 years. I can tell you I've never seen a military procession on this scale. Mm. And the rain was torrential, biblical, of epic proportions, but then it was on the Queen's coronation day too. Hopefully it's a good omen for the King. So Katie, of course, this majestic day was all about King Charles, but another royal really once again stole the show. We're talking about five-year-old Prince Louis. Talk to us about that. Well, Prince Louis, you're absolutely right. He did steal the show. Um, in fact, he's out today on his first official engagement. He's out with the scouts, with his mother, his father, and, and his brother and sister, and they are, they're currently renovating a scout shed um, over in Slough, so quite a big thing for him to be doing his first engagement. But these pictures are of him at his first official state occasion, and it doesn't get any bigger than a coronation. In fact, the next coronation that Louis is going to see, of course, will be his father's. Mm. Um, I, there, were, there was a bit of a last-minute question mark over whether Louis was even going to attend. There was a plan in place that he'd arrive at the service, be part of that procession, and then be quietly squirreled off, which is, <laughs> I think, what most people with a five-year-old would probably do, because anyone with a small child knows that you're taking a big risk having them at a two-hour ceremony. He was ferried out and for a little while, but he was there for the end for the national anthem. And what a special thing for that little prince to witness. Katie, you mentioned the concert and what Prince William said there. How did the concert go down with the Brits? Well, you know what? It's funny because I think we were all expecting it to be a bit of a disappointment because that's what we Brits seem to do. We sort of, we start off with low expectations and you might remember <laughs> there were reports that Ed Sheeran had turned it down, Elton John had turned it down. It was all going to be a bit of a disaster. Well, you know what? It wasn't. It was absolutely breathtaking. We've never seen Windsor Castle lit up the way it was. This, I think, was one of the biggest stages ever built. Katy Perry in that phenomenal Westwood gown. What a wonderful tribute to the late Vivian Westwood. I mean, you know, it was sensational. And I spoke to someone close to the King this morning who had been with him actually last night. There was a pre-party before the concert and an after party. And I said, how is His Majesty feeling <laughs> after this epic weekend? He said, elated, exhausted <laughs> and absolutely knackered. <laughs> That's a good word right there. I, I feel that just watching all the festivities. So imagine actually taking part and in it. And you're not 75. <laughs> exactly. Right, exactly. <laughs> Katie Nagel, thanks so much. The race for the Republican presidential nomination is heating up. While polling shows former President Trump with a healthy lead, rival candidates like former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson are planning their strategies to try and campaign against Trump. Hutchinson sat down with our very own Chuck Todd for this week's Meet the Press.
Well, hello there, Joe and Lindsay. This week I Meet the Press. I had Republican presidential candidate, former governor of Arkansas, Asa Hutchinson, join me. And he uh, joined to discuss his run for the 2024 nomination. This is what he had to say about trying to go head-to-head -head with former President Donald Trump. He was responsible for a lot of the failure and growth that we expected and wins in a number of different states. And so his numbers were down. Since then, uh, his numbers have gone up because uh, he's played the victim. People believe he's been picked on because of some uh, prosecutions. Uh, I joke in some ways that his campaign manager is Alvin Bragg in New York City. Mm. Uh, that indictment caused those numbers to go up because they don't believe they're fair. Mm. This will settle out over time. And so let's judge it, uh, understanding that we're right. early in the campaign. We've got a lot of a lot of room to grow. Uh, it's funny you bring up the legal issues, the, the seditious conspiracy convictions of the Proud Boys. Um, that's a That was a tall uh, task for justice to prove that case. They were able to prove it. Um, as a, You have experience dealing uh, in the Justice Department as a former U.S. attorney. Were you surprised they were successful? And do you think this is a, a dire, uh, a dire uh, outcome for the former president? Well, they are difficult cases to make. Uh, it's a high bar, and uh, they were successful in it. And I think it really reflects uh, the seriousness of the offense of January 6th in undermining our democracy and how seriously the jury considers this, that found them guilty of that. Whenever you look at the impact on the future, uh, Donald Trump has a moral responsibility for what happened on January 6th. You can see my full interview and a lot more at meetthepress.com. You can also get a lot more Meet the Press right here on NBC News Now every single weekday at 4 p.m. Make sure to check it out. Chuck Todd, thank you. A nonprofit group in Texas is looking to create a new path for people who are experiencing homelessness. NBC News correspondent Harry Smith takes a closer look. In this otherwise unremarkable area of Austin, Texas, there is a community that very well might be an answer, even the answer, to a problem plaguing cities coast to coast. And we have a phrase that housing alone will never solve homelessness, but community will. Community. It's about community. It's about people being lonely, man. We're in the middle of the Mobile Loaves and Fishes Community First Village with founder and CEO Alan Graham. What started with a few used trailers has now grown to scores of tiny houses. There will be more than 500 units by the end of the year. There's a waiting list of 160. As for rules, restrictions for drug or alcohol dependency do not exist. Zero. We live in a world where we have been experimenting with prohibiting those things for over 100 years here in the United States. And how successful are we? The village is faith-based. Its ethos found in both the Old and New Testaments. Love your neighbor. Bold egg. Sprinkled among the formerly homeless are people like Neil and Lynn Nolan, who chose to leave their affluent Austin neighborhood and instead live here, as the Bible says, among the least of these. You two have been out there almost a year now. What's the most important thing you've learned? It's easy to say I'm going to meet people on their level, but it's another thing to actually live it and do it on a daily basis. It's evangelism minus the sermons. It's faith with works. What we want people to do is preach the gospel often and only when necessary use words. <laughs> no proselytizing allowed. That's why most of our neighbors love Christ but can't stand Christians. In the village, there's an art studio and work opportunities. A hydroponic garden supplies free fresh produce. But utopia, this is not. The two essential human needs are the need to be fully and wholly loved and fully and wholly known. When you bring all that uh, to the table, it creates an environment of uh, welcoming. But Harry, it has a side salad of tension. It's life. It's real life. With all the beauty and the marinade of the dysfunction all put into that one little tasty gumbo, man. JR figures he may have been on the street for 20 years, but no more. And you'll never find another place that cares about people like this. If this place didn't exist, 
Would you still be on the street? If this place would, <laughs> didn't exist, I'd be dead. That's just the truth. We sat with JR on his porch, listening to him play the blues, mournful notes that belied a hymn of gratitude. Our thanks to Harry Smith for that report. And according to Mobile Loaves and Fishes, more than 300 people are now living in the community. Coming up, more and more companies are already using AI for jobs once held by humans. We'll show you just how AI is taking over the workforce, why some experts are worried about where things are headed. You're watching Morning News Now. Now with some financial headlines, the Biden administration is expected to announce some new rules that could change the way airlines handle delays and cancellations. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us with that and other money news. Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning to you, Joe and Lindsay. Yep, the White House says President Biden will announce today that the administration aims to write new rules to protect airline passengers. The Department of Transportation would require airlines to compensate people for major flight delays or cancellations when the airlines are responsible. Expenses could include hotels and meals. Most airlines voluntarily committed last year to offering hotels and meals, but have resisted providing cash for delays. Meantime, AI is everything, everywhere at once these days, it seems. Google plans to upgrade its search engine, reportedly, to make it visual, quote, snackable, personal, and human. The Wall Street Journal reports that Google is going to nudge the service further away from the 10 blue links, which is the traditional format of presenting search results, planning to incorporate more human voices. At its annual developers conference this week, Google is expected to debut new features, allowing users to have conversations with an AI program, a project that's codenamed Magi. Meantime, Carl's Jr. and Hardee's are rolling out artificial intelligence in the drive through lane. CKE Restaurants, the parent company of the fast food chains, is partnering with several startups to automate voice ordering at participating locations nationwide. The move is aimed at boosting accuracy, speed, and revenue and helping restaurants manage staffing shortages. Carl's Juniors and Hardee's have about 2,800 locations in 44 states. And, and apparently in the places where they've beta tested this, people like it. It's, it's much more efficient. My worry is if it hooks up with my phone and says, you know, Bertha, your LDL is getting a little high. Do you really right. want to be having that cheeseburger this <laughs> week? Might, might help you that's, out. That's my real concern. Might, well, that's why it AI might help is me. snackable. But, yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and that's <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Bertha, thank you. <laughs> Let's keep this conversation going. Silicon Valley is facing a major shakeup after a pioneer of artificial intelligence, Jeffrey Hinton, stepped down from Google. He says the programs may be headed down a dark path, but not everybody in tech agrees with him. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward has the details. You've seen the movies. Humans build robots. What am I? Robots rebel. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. It all goes bad. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. And already, in these early days of AI chatbots, we've seen some pretty weird behavior from tech like ChatGPT. AI doesn't have to be sentient to be scary. The first release of Microsoft's AI-powered chatbot trying to convince a New York Times reporter to leave his wife. I said, you know, I'm married. And it said, well, you're married, but you're not happy. And you're not happy because you're not with me. And now, an early AI pioneer has retired from Google and is speaking out about it. I wanted to be able to talk about what I thought were some looming problems. It's what comes after ChatGPT that has Jeffrey Hinton worried. ChatGPT knows much more than any one person. It doesn't yet know it very deeply. It's not yet very good at reasoning, but that'll change. There's a small chance that it could get smarter than us in the next five years or so. There's a much larger chance it can get smarter than us in the next 20 years. Already, companies like IBM are announcing plans to slow hiring for positions that AI could replace. And intelligence officials have been sounding the alarm about AI dangers, like supercharging misinformation campaigns. Democracies with open information environments are the most vulnerable to them. Some argue the worry is overblown. Of course, powerful technologies have risks. The alarmism, the part that I'm much more skeptical of, is AI taking over the world, doomsday. And frankly, there's no data 
to support that. But even as tech leaders like Google's former CEO praise the possibilities, getting better materials, solving climate change, managing our energy systems better. He says companies need to get better about seeing the threats early. If left to our own devices, our industry is going to maximize revenue because they're good business people, right? And I'm proud to be one of those people. But the fact of the matter is there should be some limits on what can be done. 15 years ago, I was a huge proponent of social media in all forms. And I did not see that it could be misused. I just didn't see it. And while Hinton says there are enormous benefits to the technology he spent a career building, the risks are too large to ignore. That's why I'm speaking out publicly. I want to get a lot more people thinking about how we're going to keep control of this stuff. Our thanks to Jake Ward for that report. Lot to think about. It definitely is. All right, coming up, it will not be a cruel summer for Swifties. Taylor Swift is releasing the re-recorded version of her Speak Now album. We've got more on that and some of the surprises she's including in this new recording next. The MTV Movie and TV Awards took place yesterday, but not how organizers originally planned. It was the first award show to take place since the start of the writer's strike, with Drew Barrymore pulling out of hosting in solidarity with WGA members. So the ceremony was not broadcast live, but there were still some popular winners. Best Movie went to the horror classic, calling it a classic, I guess, Scream 6. <laughs> Actor Tom Cruise received a popcorn statuette for Best Performance in Top Gun Maverick. The Last of Us won Best Show, and... Its star, Pedro Pascal, also won Best Hero. Meanwhile, Jennifer Coolidge won the Most Frightened Performance Award for her role in White Lotus, because all those gays were after her. <laughs> she was fighting for her she life. She was frightened. <laughs> <laughs> all right. She is wowing arenas on her Eras tour and has an incredible 10 albums in the top 100 of the Billboard 200 albums chart. Now Taylor Swift fans have even more reason to celebrate. And after weeks of speculation and some cryptic clues scattered across social media, the star announced she would be re-releasing another one of her classic albums, 2010 Speak Now. Take a look at how she unveiled the surprise. I thought I would just show you. So if you would direct your attention to the back big screen that we have. Everybody goes crazy. That, that was a response. <laughs> Bravo personality and host of Shaken and Disturbed, Darren Cart joins us now to talk about this. So what do we know? Do we have a date yet? And, and what are some things fans can look forward to? Well, if you could hear above the screaming, <laughs> you know, I, I think I heard it around the country the day that she announced this on her Nashville Eras tour. Uh, first stop at Nashville and Eras tour. Yes, Speak Now, Taylor's version is coming out July 7th, which is a little bit of an Easter egg in and of itself. Uh, and the reason is she loves, like, just popping things into fans. I mean, she's she uses social media kind of in the best way. And July 7th is actually uh, National Koi Fish Day. And she's had a lot of koi fish in the last few music oh. videos that she's released. Bejeweled had it in, Antihero she had it in, Lavender Haze. So fans were all about this and they're super excited to see this. That is a puzzle I would have never <laughs> yes. put together right there. So good for those fans who would yeah. have figured that out. We should note, by the way, our senior Taylor Swift correspondent, Savannah Sellers, <laughs> oh was God. at the concert in Nashville last night, which is why she's and not she's here still this alive? morning. Like, we haven't I don't we should check. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I was saying, she might have lost her hearing. Thinking that's for of sure. that, yes. Remind us why we got to this point. Why is Swift re-recording so many of these albums? Yeah, music is a complicated business, and Scooter Braun decided to buy her entire catalog from Big Machine when she was originally recording this stuff. And so that was without Taylor's permission. So in order for her to take back her words, take back her album, she's actually re-recording all of these albums kind of one by one. We've seen two of these versions before. I'm sure we're gonna get more. So this happened a few years ago, and this is kind of her big middle finger uh, to the music industry, if you will, in that way. So, I mean, how do some of these re-recordings differ from the originals? Well, sometimes, you know, it's kind of this new adult Taylor, a little bit of a version. Yeah, I mean, different you know, sound, this, right? A little bit of a different sound. Of course, you know, she's older now. You know, originally Speak Now was recorded in 2010, between the ages of 18 and 20. Now it's 13 years later. So she's a full-grown woman. I mean, even on the album cover, you kind of see she's in a similar dress, but she's not the same demure 20-year-old of recording this album anymore. So you get the adult version in Speak Now. She's doing six new tracks of just unreleased wow. unreleased songs from her vault. So we are gonna get kind of this new flavor, this new spice of Taylor. And it's just been so fun to watch her. I mean, she really is so good to her fans and Some she's incredible. Music, I mean, still, 
you can have even different meetings. Like, why you got to be so mean? I mean, that's like a, an anthem today, too. You well, know? as you know, things change in your 20s to your 30s. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot more kind of meaning behind all of this stuff. And getting to watch her kind of be an adult. I mean, she's kind of been preparing this her entire time. She really is like a true artist. It's we have about incredible. 20 seconds left here. But I mean, yep. just what's the legacy she is creating right now yeah. this far into her career? I mean, she's been doing this on the Eras Tour. Then she released Midnight's. I mean, she constantly, it feels like she's reinventing herself, even though she's still so young. I don't really look at her as this artist that needs to reinvent herself because right. she's still coming out with music, and yet she's surprising us all the time. I mean, she really is building such a solid legacy, and I think she's only getting started. I think it's crazy. funny. She, she's like winning like Lifetime Achievement Awards already. Right. <laughs> she's, like, like, yeah. she's younger like, than me. I doing? have a complex. <laughs> I'm having a complex. All right. Don't have a complex. You're doing great. Yes. We're all doing great. Yeah. All right. We're doing great. Darren Carp, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Good morning, everybody. I'm Lizzie Weiser in for Savannah Sellers. Good to have you with us on this Monday. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, a broken community. Overnight, this emotional vigil taking place in North Texas. They were remembering the eight lives lost in that state's second mass shooting in a little more than a week, this time at a mall just outside of Dallas. The lone gunman was killed by police. We are learning chilling new information about him. Plus, we're going to hear from an eyewitness who was there. Also in Texas this morning, tragedy on the border. Police say eight people, some of them migrants from Venezuela, were killed, several more injured when a car plowed into them in the border city of Brownsville. They were enthusiastic about uh, being here already in the United States and, and they're ready to go to meet their family. Investigators now trying to uncover a mode of a tragedy that comes with a surge of migrants expected this week as a controversial COVID era border policy is set to be lifted. Also this morning, flight for your right. New rules from the Biden administration aimed at holding airlines accountable for those lengthy delays and maddening cancellations. What's going to change and how it could affect your next trip? And it was a lavish weekend of pomp and pageantry in Britain as King Charles III officially became king. We've got all the highlights, the controversies, and what's next for the fractured royal family as His Majesty takes the throne. Number of people up early on Saturday morning. morning. Yeah. I DVR'd it. <laughs> what? <laughs> you don't want to watch it with the world? I didn't want to watch it with the world. Oh. I, I knew what was going to happen. Okay. We will recap it for you, whatever you missed, or if you want to relive those moments. We're going to begin this hour with new developments in the investigation into that mass shooting in Texas. Police have identified a single gunman who will be charged with opening, rather, was killed after opening fire at a Dallas area outlet mall, killing eight people and injuring seven others. The youngest victim just five years old. And this morning, we're learning more about the alleged gunman and what officials say may have led him to commit this horrible act. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky is in Allen, Texas with the latest. Yeah, here in Allen, this massive complex remains very much an active crime scene with law enforcement keeping it locked down as a memorial grows for those eight lives lost. And this mall has been a shopping destination for families all across North Texas. Uh, many of those families since scrambling to recover when that gunman opened fire Saturday afternoon. And we do want to warn you, some of the video you're about to see is disturbing. Overnight, a community marred by gun violence coming together to mourn. A vigil honoring the eight lives lost in what is now the second deadliest mass shooting this year. Gunshots at the outlet mall. The frantic scene unfolding in Allen, Texas, just north of Dallas. Police say 33-year-old Mauricio Garcia opened fire on Saturday at this crowded outlet mall. I've got victims. We need an ambulance. Law enforcement officials tell NBC the crime's now being investigated as a case of racial or ethnically motivated violent extremism. Two officials say the suspect interacted with neo-Nazi and white supremacist content online. One official telling NBC authorities found a patch with a right-wing acronym on his chest. Sources also confirm police are reviewing this footage, showing the moment the gunman began to open fire on innocent shoppers as families barricaded themselves inside. Authorities tell NBC News the shooter wore a tactical vest and was armed with a rifle and handgun. More weapons and ammunition were later found inside his car. I heard pop, 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 shooting, and everybody ran. The suspect fatally shot by an officer who police say was already there for an unrelated call. I need 
everybody, I got it. Amid the chaos, acts of heroism, some people were huddled inside an H&M store. One of them called his father, former police officer Stephen Spainhauer, who raced to the scene. He immediately began performing first aid on victims, but for some, it was too late. The young child was underneath one of the victims, okay, laying on the ground. And their parent? They were on the ground. They were dead. The father forced to wait agonizing minutes as officers led hundreds of shoppers out of the mall before he was finally reunited with his son. The former officer agreeing with so many others that something needs to change. This is not a Democrat thing. It's not a Republican thing. It's an American problem. Now, as for the victims in this shooting, we know of the eight people taken to area hospitals, one of them was a five-year-old child, and three victims remain in critical condition. And we've also learned about one of the lives lost. He's been identified as 20-year-old Christian LaCour, who was working as a security guard here at the mall when those gunshots rang out. Over the weekend, his grandmother took to Facebook, posting he was just 20-year-old with so many goals. He was such a beautiful soul. I was so proud of him. We'll send it back to you. Morgan, thank you. For more now, we are joined by Freddie Spainauer, who was a witness to that attack, whose father you just heard from in Morgan's report. Freddie, thank you for being with us. Glad to see that you're okay. Let's take us back to Saturday. As Morgan mentioned, you were barricaded inside the H&M store break room. What is it you were doing when you first heard the gunfire, and what happened next? Well, um, I was taking my 15-minute break um, when um, the shots rang out. And I was about to go out on the floor to do my job after my break. Um, and at first, I thought the shelves fell because we get, like, heavy loads every now and then. And after that, there was complete silence. And my coworker and I just looked at each other like, what's going on? And then there were more uh, loud muffles that started to take place. And that's when we knew, okay, something ain't right. And that's when we uh, turned right around the corner from the break room. And that's when I noticed that all, all the managers and the customers that started rushing in over into the back towards the stock room. You called your father, who is a former police officer. What did he tell you to do? Um, I called my dad, um, like, right around, like, three minutes after the shots rang out. Um, he just told me to get to safety, which already, already was at this point, and we were trying to barricade the doors as quickly as possible with uh, different boxes and totes that we could find. And... Dad said that he was uh, on his way. Your father actually arrived, he says, before many police officers did. I want to play something he told our Morgan Chesky, and then I'll ask you a question on the other side. To see your son come out with his hands over his heads and have to walk past dead bodies, it's not something any parent or anybody should ever have to see. Freddie, your reaction to hearing your father say that and just that moment when you two did reunite? It was difficult um, seeing the carnage and the aftermath. Um, and I do admit, I mean, um, when I was in high school and everything, I mean, I've seen a lot of graphic footage before over in high school and everything, ranging from live leak to even like some of the footage of September 11th. But to see something like this in real life is just heartbreaking. And it's like, this is something totally different that I've never seen before. And um, I was outside of the outlet mall for um, quite a bit until my dad called me to tell me where he was. And that's when I walked over and we really reunited, reunited. And um, mom, dad and I, we uh, didn't let go from hugging each other for about a few minutes. It, it was really, uh, we, we just basically held, held each other together which we all completely understand. Freddie, 
grateful that you're okay, grateful for everything that your father did to help so many people in that moment. We wish you well. I appreciate it. Thank you. There was another tragedy in Texas this weekend. An SUV plowed into a group of people outside a migrant shelter in the border town of Brownsville, Texas. At least eight people were killed, nearly a dozen hurt. While police are still investigating why this happened, the incident occurred just days ahead of the lifting of Title 42, the COVID border restriction, and that's prompted a new wave of migrants trying to cross the border. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez is in Brownsville with the latest. Gabe, good morning. Good morning. As you mentioned, overnight the death toll here rose from seven to eight, and law enforcement officials now tell NBC News they're looking into whether this driver may have plowed his SUV into this crowd intentionally or whether it was an accident. And we should also warn you that some of the video of the crash and its aftermath is disturbing. This surveillance video shows the seconds right before an SUV plowed into a crowd waiting at a bus stop Sunday outside a migrant shelter in Brownsville, Texas. The mayor says eight people were killed, some of them migrants from Venezuela. At least nine others were injured. This morning, investigators are still trying to determine a motive. One, it could be intoxication. Two, it could be just an accidental one. Or three, it could be intentional. A bystander telling NBC News that he heard from other witnesses that the driver yelled anti-immigrant language. But police say they can't substantiate the allegation, and it's still under investigation. Law enforcement officials tell NBC News the driver is a Hispanic male who is not cooperating with investigators. He's been arrested and charged with reckless driving, but more charges could be pending. Just a terrible situation to, to witness such a tragic loss of so many lives. You know. The migrant deaths come just days after Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas visited Brownsville, touting a new processing center ahead of the lifting this week of the COVID border restriction known as Title 42. The policy change is expected to bring yet another migrant influx to the southern border, as many as 10,000 people a day. The situation at the border is a very serious one. Last week, we visited Juarez, Mexico, where thousands of migrants have already gathered. What's been the hardest part? What has been the most difficult part? The hardest part is never having work, food, or water, this man from Guatemala told us, saying he planned to cross the border with his two-year-old son. The Biden administration is preparing for the end of Title 42 by sending 1,500 active-duty troops to the border and setting up asylum processing centers in Guatemala and Colombia. But the president telling MSNBC's Stephanie Rule that Congress needs to act. There has to be a legal pathway to citizenship. Meanwhile, back here in Brownsville, makeshift memorial is growing outside of this migrant shelter. And the mayor says that several of those who were injured in the crash remain in critical condition. Joe and Lindsay. Gabe, thank you. Turning now to the latest in the case of Jordan Neely, the New York City man who was on the subway when he was put in a fatal chokehold by a fellow passenger. Over the weekend, protests in the city heated up, at times even sending parts of the nation's largest mass transportation system to a halt. Those protests continue to mount as calls for criminal charges against the man who choked Neely continue. NBC News correspondent Emily Iketa joins us now with more on the story. Emily, good morning. Good morning. Well, it's been now a week since Jordan Neely's death and no charges have been filed. According to two sources familiar with the matter, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office plans to present the case to a grand jury, which will determine if we'll see any charges. So it's not clear exactly when that will happen. Meanwhile, protests here in New York are intensifying with more set to play out today. And just a warning. Some of the images that you're about to see may be difficult to watch. This morning, growing outrage surrounding the chokehold death of 30-year-old Jordan Neely. Demonstrators demanding justice and calling for criminal charges. Some even jumping onto subway tracks in protest, leading to clashes with police. Authorities say 13 people were arrested so far. It comes as we're learning more about what happened on that deadly train ride when Neely was placed in a headlock by another passenger for at least several minutes. That passenger now identified as 24-year-old Daniel Penny, a college student and Marine veteran. In a statement, his lawyer writing, when Mr. Neely began aggressively threatening Daniel Penny and other passengers, Daniel, with the help of others, acted to protect themselves until help arrived.
arrived, adding Daniel never intended to harm Mr. Neely. While Penny was questioned by police, he has not been charged with a crime. The calls for his arrest are intensifying. We will try our hardest to make sure that he's held accountable. A source telling WNBC's Jonathan Deans that before help arrived, NYPD dispatchers received five 911 calls, including several people reporting a man making threats on board. Neely, who police say was arrested more than 40 times, was homeless and known to be struggling with mental illness since his mother's murder in 2007. Still, his family attorney says he was a talented street performer who loved to dance and make other people happy. He had demons, and we all know people who are on the brink of going through something major, and that's where he was, but he had a life that he was living. And this morning, Jordan's family put out a new statement saying, in part, Daniel Penny's press release is not an apology nor an expression of regret. It is a character assassination and a clear example of why he believed he was entitled to take Jordan's life. The investigation is ongoing. The other riders you saw in the video have not been identified. Meanwhile, the NYPD says they're still looking for six more people involved in Saturday's protest in that subway station. Something to watch. Definitely. All right, Emily, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Today, the Biden administration is expected to announce new rules for airlines in an effort to boost flyer rights. In the case of, quote, any controllable cancellations or significant delays, airlines could now be held accountable to address any expenses or inconveniences experienced by passengers. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello is at Reagan National Airport, joins us now to break this down. I mean, that controllable sounds a little vague. Any, any expenses yeah. that they incur sounds a little vague. What can people expect? Uh, bottom line, this is a, the beginning of a rulemaking process. In other words, it's not going to happen overnight. It will not happen by the summertime. It's a typical government bureaucratic process that takes a while. But today, President Biden and Secretary Buttigieg will unveil this new proposal. And the bottom line, they want to compensate you, the passenger, with cash if the airline has to cancel or delay because of things in its control. In other words, a maintenance issue, a staffing issue. It's taking too long to, to load the bags. All of that would therefore allow you to receive cash compensation from the airline specifically. That's very important. It would also mean a meal voucher and or overnight hotel accommodations and rebookings. Now, this all comes, of course, after we had the Southwest Airlines meltdown over the holidays and then last summer, of course, the major travel mess. Uh, it's also, it says, going to encourage and ensure that the airlines are offering timely customer service during this entire process. Uh, this is all coming, we should tell you, at a time when the airlines are under pressure going into the summers, summer holiday rather, not to repeat what happened last summer, not to repeat what happened in Southwest over the Christmas holidays. But again, these new passenger regulations, which are built largely on what the Europeans have already built into their system, they would not take effect probably for months at the earliest. Lindsay. So for right now, when it comes to these rules, since that's not going to be in place for a little while, what can people do if they have questions yep. about what their rights are right now? So flightrights.gov, flightrights.gov is the DOT's website where they really detail out what your rights are, but also which airlines are doing what. So for example, right now, there are 10 of the largest airlines are guaranteeing meals and free rebookings on the same airline. Uh, nine right now are guaranteeing hotel accommodations. No airline right now is guaranteeing co cash compensation in cases of preventable delays or cancellations. So that would all be a part of this new DOT regulation. I mentioned that it was built on the European experience. Let me just tell you what happened to me. Recently, I was flying from Oslo to Copenhagen back to the States. My flight from Oslo to Copenhagen was delayed. Not much, 45 minutes. I still made my connection. But because my flight was delayed by 45 minutes, the government required that I was offered cash compensation. That's what the European law requires. I personally thought that that was kind of crazy. I mean, I still made my <laughs> connection, right? No big deal. I didn't request the money, but that's kind of what the hmm. Biden administration is proposing here. All right. We'll see how it all unfolds. Tom, thanks. Time for a check on your morning news now. Weather for the week ahead. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us now. Good morning, Michelle.
Good morning to you both. So good to see you. And we are starting out stormy in spots. We're going to see storms for the next few days in spots as we go throughout this work week. Taking a look at radar, you can see some rain falling in portions of the Midwest. That's where you see those brighter colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows. That's the heavy rain falling. And we are expecting heavy rain uh, today, tomorrow through Wednesday in some spots. So taking a look at the week ahead, this is today. Strong storms, especially this afternoon, this evening into the Ohio Valley portions of the middle Mississippi Valley, but we have rain stretching at least a chance of rain from the Midwest all the way down to portions of the plains. Plenty of sunshine in the southwest. It's going to feel like summer there with temperatures into the mid 90s, even upper 90s in some spots. And then the Pacific Northwest, we have a new system moving onshore that's going to bring cool and soggy conditions. So some lower elevation rain in the valleys, the coastal uh, parts of the northern California into the Pacific Northwest. And then we're going to see some higher elevation snow mixing in with some rain in the Cascades. As we look towards Wednesday, below average temperatures in parts of the west, more showers and storms stretching from the northern plains to the central plains into the southern plains. We're worried about or concerned about the chance for some flooding conditions there. Pleasant, really, along the Carolina coast into the mid-Atlantic, the northeast with lots of sunshine. Really nice temperatures on Wednesday in those areas. By Friday, May warmth, we're going to see temperatures into the 80s in the northeast. Midwest storms once again and a lot of rain for many on Friday stretching from the Intermountain West into the Plains, the Ohio Valley, parts of the Tennessee Valley, and also along the Gulf Coast into the Southeast. It'll be warm in the Pacific Northwest. Notice those highs in Northern California into the upper 80s. So for today, over the next few days, we have a frontal boundary system that's sort of draped from the mid-Atlantic all the way down to the plains. And that's going to bring the chance for showers, some storms, even a flooding risk from Wisconsin to Louisiana. The best chance for storms would be in portions of uh, the Ohio Valley into parts of the plains. We have heavy rain developing the southeast in southeast Texas, severe threat continuing in the southern plains. And then by tomorrow, we'll see that flooding threat into parts of uh, southeast Texas, the chance for some severe storms. And when we say severe storms, what does that mean? Well, we're looking at the chance for winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour and also the chance for some hail. Back to you guys. All right. Thank you so much, Michelle. Appreciate it. Coming up sure. on Morning News Now, the debt ceiling fight on Capitol Hill heating up ahead of that critical June 1st deadline. We'll take a look at the key meeting between President Biden and congressional leaders tomorrow. Is a deal possible? And what could happen if one isn't reached? We'll take a closer look next. We're back and the clock is ticking for Congress to raise the debt ceiling before June 1st. That's the date when Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned the U.S. could breach the debt ceiling. But reaching a deal is going to take a lot of work. Over the weekend, 43 senators sent a letter to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. In it, they said, quote, we will not be voting for cloture on any bill that raises the debt ceiling without substantive spending and budget reforms. Now, Democrats are vowing not to negotiate if Republicans insist on tying a debt ceiling vote to spending cuts. President Biden is set to meet with congressional leaders at the White House tomorrow to try and hammer out a deal. In an exclusive interview on the 11th hour with Stephanie Rule, President Biden had this to say. Is Kevin McCarthy an honest broker for you to negotiate with? I think he's an honest man. I think he's in a position, though, he had to make a deal that was pretty, you know, 15 votes, <laughs> 15 votes that uh, where he uh, just about sold away everything. Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us now with more on all this. Ryan, good morning. So House Republicans are demanding President Biden and Democrats agree to these significant fiscal reforms in exchange for raising the debt limit. What are some of their demands and how is the White House responding to this? Well, they want a number of, of different provisions that would really rein in spending at the federal level. Among them, uh, clawing back some of the COVID money that's gone unspent. They want to uh, install permitting reform. They've also talked about things like reducing spending back to 2022 levels. Uh, they've got a long list of provisions that they passed in the House back bill. And that 43 number that you point to in that letter that was sent by senators to President Biden is important because it shows that Republicans in the Senate can hold back any momentum uh, that a, a deal that could potentially be cut because it would require 60 votes to pass in the Senate. Uh, so the Republicans right now go into this meeting tomorrow with an important hand. They've already passed the bill. And now it's incumbent on Democrats to say what they'd be willing to negotiate to get this debt ceiling bill over the finish line, Joe. So, so tomorrow's a big day. President Biden is set to meet with Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, House Speaker McCarthy, and then the House Democratic Leader Hakeem Jeffries. Seems both sides are obviously pretty far apart, even for a short-term deal right now. 
Yeah, it does seem that way, Joe. At least that's their public position, right? Uh, I think what many are hoping is that when they get behind closed doors, that's where the real negotiating can happen. Uh, we can see if there's any uh, ability for President Biden to try and, and provide some sort of exit ramp here where not necessarily a, a bill that's tied to the debt ceiling, but some sort of negotiation that would tie these negotiations to the negotiation over the spending plan, which is due in September. That would be a scenario where perhaps you'd see this pushed off into the fall. At this point, though, their public positions have not changed an inch, despite that alarming letter from the Treasury Secretary saying that this could be uh, as soon as June 1st, where we're dealing with the situation where America could default on its loans. Uh, so this meeting is as high stakes as it gets, Joe. Yeah, and quickly remind us about what's at stake here, Ryan. What are the potential impacts if we do breach the debt ceiling? I mean, not to understate it, uh, Joe, you really can't. Uh, this, it could be economic calamity. It could lead to a stock market crash. It could mean a 401ks uh, could implode. It could also mean things uh, like the housing sector uh, could crash. Uh, there's also the risk of federal benefits uh, being able to be paid out for things like veterans benefits and things along those lines, uh, SNAP benefits. Everything that the federal government spends money on uh, is potentially in the crosshairs here if they are not able to come up with a debt ceiling agreement. Uh, and it would, of course, be the first time ever that the United States defaulted on its loans. It could mean that going forward, America always has to pay more for the interest that it takes out. Uh, so the stakes here are very, very large. June 1st, now three and a half weeks away. All right, Ryan, thank you so much. Turning now to the legal trouble surrounding convicted murderer Alex Murdoch. Earlier this year, the disgraced lawyer was convicted of murdering his wife and son. And now Murdoch has made a major confession in a life insurance fraud lawsuit that was filed against him over the death of his longtime housekeeper. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck joins us now from Walterboro, South Carolina with the latest. Katie, good morning. Good morning, Lindsay. Another legal battle heating up here. Attorneys for Alec Murdoch's former housekeeper say today they're going to release new audio recording and new documents tied to her case. This, as an insurance company, is fighting to recover that $3.8 million settlement money. And Alec Murdoch from prison is admitting that he didn't tell the truth again in connection to another mysterious death. Alec Murdoch is changing his story once again, this time from a prison cell. After admitting during his trial to lying about his alibi the night his wife and son were killed. I did lie to them. Murdoch is now confessing to even more lies, this time surrounding the mysterious death of the family's longtime housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield. She died at the Murdoch home after allegedly suffering a fall in 2018. The disgraced lawyer originally told his insurance company that the family's dogs caused her to trip and fall. He later collected millions in settlement money intended for Satterfield's sons, who say they never saw any of it. Did you ever get one cent from Alec Murdoch when he was still uh, before all of this happened? No. Back in 2021, Satterfield's son Tony told Craig Alec Murdoch promised he would help him and his brother get an insurance settlement for the accident. Did you believe him? Yeah, of course. Well, why not? He said, I want to make sure the boys are taken care of because he loved Gloria that much. Now, a legal storm is brewing over Murdoch's latest confession. In a new statement made in response to a recent lawsuit filed by an insurance company looking to recover the $3.8 million it paid Murdoch for Satterfield's death, Murdoch now claims he fabricated his initial story, writing, no dogs were involved in Satterfield's death, adding he invented the situation to force his insurers to make a settlement payment. Murdoch also says the Satterfield family did actually receive the fraudulent funds. Lawyers for the Satterfields family deny they got money from the insurance company, saying the new claims lack credibility, much like Alec Murdoch. The question is, is Alex to be believed? Alex at this point in time will say anything to uh, try to preserve his own skin. Police have reopened the investigation into Satterfield's death. We reached out to Murdoch's attorney who had no comment about the lawsuit or why Alec Murdoch is once again changing his story from behind bars. Murdoch is now serving two life sentences for the murders of his wife and son, but he still faces nearly 100 other charges ranging from money laundering to stealing from his clients. Murdoch's attorney says they have filed that notice to appeal and they intend to do so in coming months.
Lindsay. All right, Katie, thank you so much. Now to some international headlines. Rescuers are searching for survivors after a tourist boat overturned in southern India. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Claudio, good morning. Lindsay, Joe, good morning. Yes, at least 22 people have so far died after a tourist boat capsized in India on Sunday night. Now, officials say the double-decker tourist boat was carrying 50 people or double its capacity when it overturned and blame overcrowding for the incident. At least four people were taken to hospital and are in critical condition and the death toll is expected to rise as the number of missing passengers is still unknown. Survivors told local media that many on board were not wearing life jackets. Let's go to Ukraine, where an official appointed by Russia said about uh, said that almost 1,700 people were evacuated from areas near the nuclear plant of Zaporizhia on Sunday. Now, the announcement comes a day after the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency said the situation around the plant has become increasingly unpredictable and potentially dangerous. Ukraine is expected to start soon a counteroffensive to retake Russian-held territory, including in the region around the nuclear plant. And finally, winter has come early to Australia. The southeast of the country has been buttered by a cold front that brought high winds, snow and hail that could last until the middle of this week. Temperatures along the east coast dropped below zero, bringing some snow even in the capital Canberra, as shown by videos shared on social media. In Sydney, flights were delayed temporarily on Sunday due to strong winds, guys. All right, beginning to look a lot like winter there. Thank you, Claudio. Appreciate it. Coming up, there's been an increase in anti-LGBTQ bills in Republican-led state legislatures lately. And those bills, along with the rhetoric surrounding them, are having a major impact on groups like drag performers. When we come back, we're going to hear from some of those performers speaking out just ahead of Pride Month. That's next. A wave of anti-LGBTQ bills has been introduced in Republican-led states, spreading fear among those in the community, including drag performers. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton spoke to performers in Tennessee, where a statewide ban on drag shows was passed in March. Here's just some of what she discussed for the season premiere of Meet the Press Reports. As a transgender woman raised in Tennessee, she spent years hiding who she was. It wasn't until she turned 18 and stepped out onto her first drag show stage that she realized it didn't have to be that way. And I didn't have the words for it. It was one of the few times I felt powerful. I felt seen. I felt mm -hmm. right in my skin. I can do anything I need to do when I'm in drag. Wait, are, are all the children out of the building? Are there any children? Look around. If you're a child, raise your hand. Not emotionally, I mean like legally. For Story and her friend who performs under the name Harry Scary, it's begun to feel like their very existence is a political act. The agenda is to just exist and to not, and to feel valid. The agenda is to be able to go to the bathroom without having to worry about being punched in the face. State Senate Majority Leader Jack Johnson, a Republican from Franklin, Tennessee, sponsored the new restrictive legislation. The law targets adult-oriented performances that are harmful to minors. It doesn't say exactly how performances will be determined to be harmful or sexual. Have you been to drag shows? Have not. But I've seen videos. I've seen videos of, of drag. Well, and I, I guess I should say, have I been to places where a man was dressed as a woman and, and performing or singing? And maybe they were, were dressed, it was a Halloween party and they were dressed up as Dolly Parton? Of course I have. Are you trying to send a signal? Of course that not. some types of communities, some types of people aren't welcome here in Tennessee? The only signal I'm trying to send is that you shouldn't be doing sexually graphic, you shouldn't be simulating sex acts in front of children. And NBC's Antonia Hilton joined us now with a closer look at her report. So, so walk us through, because I think there's still some confusion over these bills and, and the impact they're having, especially in Tennessee right now, which is sort of the first, and others are looking at this, right? That's right. So this is the first law that's been passed of its kind, but it might not be the only. In about 17 states, very similar bills are under consideration right now. And they're a little bit different, but what they mostly look like are restrictions on drag performances and trying to keep these performances away from children in public or anywhere a child might see them. And that's part of what's fostered this confusion. That means if you're on the rooftop of an adult venue, but a child might be able to see you from another building, 
that could cause a challenge for the business that you run, for the performance that you're hosting. That means that events like festivals, uh, parades that LGBTQ people might want to attend, uh, if children happen to be nearby, that could put these performers in legal jeopardy. And so that's part of what has caused so much fear. Um, and so this bill is actually right now under a temporary restraining order. Uh, due to the actions of a Trump-appointed judge just a couple weeks ago. But we'll find out soon in a few weeks, is this law going to be moving forward? Will it be implemented in the state? Or are performers going to have to go to trial to defend their art form? Are you finding that they're already making changes? Like, for example, I'm not going to perform unless there's security. Absolutely. We are hearing that every single day from performers right now, that on an individual level, they're changing their routines, frightened that people will take a video of them, post it on social media, uh, and that their lives will be threatened. They're hiring private security to work with them or with the venues and the businesses that they are attached to. And many of these organizations, they don't have a whole lot of money. This is extremely costly for them. So there are also some performers who are simply taking a step back from their work right now and not sure uh, you know, what their connection to the drag community might look like going forward. You also spoke with some leaders of Drag Story Hours. This is when drag queens read for kids in local libraries. What did you hear from them and how worried are some of them about their safety and security? They're very, very worried, Joe. Um, and that's because Drag Story Hour has really been at the center of a lot of the extremist response. We have seen Nazis, we have seen extremist organizations like the Proud Boys go to story reading hours and intimidate many of the performers. In fact, as part of the extended version of this story, uh, we sit down with a performer who had Proud Boys storm their reading in front of children. And so they are forming security and volunteer groups. Uh, they're getting trained on CPR, gunshot wound response. And so that is the level of seriousness here, that people are really reevaluating performances, events at libraries that used to be um, you know, pretty simple and straightforward. There is now a lot of work and security uh, steps that performers are taking before they ever even step foot in these libraries right now. You've been spending a lot of time reporting on this. What do you want to leave people with? One of the takeaways and how can people watch your reporting? I think one of the major takeaways right now is that we're hearing a lot of politicians talk about parental rights uh, because that's driving what's well, behind a lot of this, this fear that drag performances are inappropriate for children um, and that parents have the rights to reach out to libraries and to cancel these performances to uh, keep certain people from coming to schools for events. Um, and I think it's important to listen to those parents' voices, but also remember that there are parents of LGBTQ children, parents who are LGBTQ, and uh, they have other opinions on these matters. And when you talk about parental rights, you have to remember all parents have a seat at the table, and we've tried to do that in this story. Because they're worried their rights are being infringed upon to be able to talk about their That's lives. That's what we're hearing. All right. Antonia, thank you so much. And to reiterate, you can stream the full episode of Meet the Press Reports Anti-Drag Movement anytime on the Peacock app and YouTube. Antonia, thank you as always for your reporting. Still to come, offering life after enduring some of the most difficult parts of a loved one's death. After the break, we're going to show you how one group is changing the lives of families who choose to donate their loved one's organs, offering growth through grief. This is Morning News Now. Researchers are taking a closer look at the benefits of grief support, a service provided to those who lose a loved one. And for one family, that additional help was crucial when deciding whether to go through the organ donation process. NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sayal has that story. Christopher Moss, coming off his 20th wedding anniversary with wife Denise, started to have chest pain one evening in 2022. We were actually sitting here in the family room. Right here? Yes, yes. He was taken to the hospital, where doctors confirmed the worst. He had died from a heart attack. I felt like everything had just, my whole world had ended. Struck by grief, Denise was faced with the ultimate question, what to do with Chris's organs? At first, I, I, I told them I can't have this conversation right now. Um, I needed some time. They had called again, and I had finally um, started talking with some people. I. I knew in my heart it was the right thing to do. Was there a part of you that was that was scared? Yes, yes, I was. Because um, it was hard for me to figure out what he wanted to do. After donation, 
Denise was put in touch with Taylor's Gift, a nonprofit organization that provides emotional support for donor families grieving the loss of a loved one. When you think of organ, eye, and tissue donation, people's immediate thought is a surrounding death. But organ, eye, and tissue donation is all about life. That's what it's about. And so we want to change that conversation. Tara Storch and her husband Todd founded Taylor's Gift in 2010 after losing their daughter Taylor in a ski accident, leaving them to grieve without much help. Our focus is to help families like ours. From our experience, our personal experience, there really wasn't a dedicated grief support service specifically for donor families. Dr. Macy Levin, director for the Center for Surgical and Transplant Applied Research at NYU Langone Health, has been working with Taylor's Gift to study how it's changing the lives of families undergoing organ donation. She says, not enough families have access to this kind of life-changing service. Donation circumstances are very unexpected and they are very tragic. And the people that are with the Taylor's Gift Foundation have actually walked the walk before. So you're really talking and walking with someone who has um, also suffered a loss. Now, Taylor's Gift says they've helped millions of people register for organ donation since 2010. And in less than a year, its grief support program has provided free counseling to more than 200 family members of organ donors. For Denise, after weekly phone calls over the course of a year, a new outlook on life and joy in Christopher's donation. I'm just really proud of her. Thank you. She's done so well, and I'm really proud of how much she's grown. Dr. Akshay Sayal, NBC News. Financial headlines now. A new survey by Bankrate finds money is often a major cause of stress for most Americans, even more than last year. All right, CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us with that and other news. Good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Yeah, more than half of adults say money has a negative impact on their mental health. That is up from 42% a year ago, according to a new survey from Bankrate. People say they experience money concerns at least once a week. And of that group, more than 80% of them say stress and anxiety are caused by economic factors, including rising prices and interest rates and just not having a stable income or job security. Bankrate says Americans are feeling pretty bad about their finances with inflation at the center of a lot of worries. Despite a strong job market, wage growth just hasn't kept pace with the rising cost of living. Personal debt is increasing and for a number of folks, savings are dwindling. Binance, meantime, has lifted a pause on Bitcoin withdrawals after halting them twice this weekend. The crypto exchange blaming the move on high volume, saying its platform was congested with too many pending transactions. The firm says to prevent a similar occurrence in future, it's adjusted its transaction fees. Binance has slid down the ranks for Bitcoin trading volume and is no longer among the world's top 10 exchanges. And Chris Pratt reigns at the box office. Well, he, he has already for a month. So he th dethroned himself. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 topped the weekend box office with a $114 million take. That, according to Comscore, which ends the four-week streak of the Super Mario Brothers, which Chris Pratt is in, which had been at number one. The latest Guardians installment from Disney and Marvel matching projections in North America, and it's also the 32nd straight Marvel film to debut at number one. Marvel also accounts for half of the 12 movies that have opened with more than 100 million bucks since the start of the pandemic. And you know what that means? There will be more Marvel films yeah. to come. I think Marvel's Back figured out this you. movie thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think they got it down. I think so, right? <laughs> Bertha, thank you. Coming up, it was a weekend of pageantry and celebration fit for a king. We've got everything you might have missed from the coronation of King Charles. Yeah, in case you didn't DVR it like Joe, including <laughs> what's next for Prince Harry, who was notably absent from that famous balcony wave. We've got you covered after the break. It was a weekend of parties over in the UK as the country celebrated the coronation of King Charles and Queen Camilla. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter takes us through the most memorable moments. 
Yeah, the weather has not improved since Saturday. At least it is not driving rain like we saw at certain moments on Saturday. But we got a front row seat just around the corner from Buckingham Palace, right on the Mall, with the crowds, the faithful who have been camping out. A lot of history-making moments and a couple of very cute moments as well with the Littlest Royals. Take a look. From start to finish, it was a spectacular affair. The kind of pageantry the Brits do so well in the kind of weather the Brits know so well. Through the driving rain, King Charles and Queen Camilla arriving at Westminster Abbey, their pages of honor, including nine-year-old Prince George, doing the heavy lifting. The Waleses, all stunning, Kate and Charlotte in matching Alexander McQueen, and five-year-old Prince Louis with a big yawn caught on camera. Prince Harry arriving at the Abbey with cousins Eugenie and Beatrice, smiling a quick wave to his aunt, Princess Anne. The crowning moments all went to plan. God save the king! God save the king! And outside, braving the elements, the tens of thousands on the mouse singing along to God save the king. We were amid the faithful who'd been waiting for hours, even <laughs> days, for this moment. And you can hear the deafening cheers around me. That was pretty exciting. I think I just made eye contact with, uh, with King Charles. And then the mall opened and the excited, albeit soggy, crowds headed for Buckingham Palace. Are you excited? Yeah. Woo! But they had to pass us on the way there. A few thousand of Molly Hunter's best friends. Stepping out onto the balcony, the king and queen, the pages of honor, working royals, and of course, Charlotte and Louis too. But no Prince Harry. He got into a car right after the service, seen later at Heathrow Airport as expected, missing the rest of the weekend's blowout festivities. But Prince William taking center stage at the coronation concert at Windsor Castle. As my grandmother said when she was crowned, coronations are a declaration of our hopes for the future. And I know she's up there fondly keeping an eye on us, and she'll be a very proud mother. Even little Princess Charlotte up way past her bedtime singing along. An extravagant end to a weekend 70 years in the making. Now, last night at the coronation concert, of course, that happened at Windsor Castle in the back in the beautiful gardens. The king and queen, after a very heavily scheduled, perfectly choreographed weekend, actually took a little leave and had some fun with the American Idol audience, made an appearance with Lionel Richie and Katy Perry. Pretty fun to see that. I'll send it back to you guys. All right. Looks like fun, Molly. Thank you. Molly's got the wave down. No kidding. <laughs> Joining us now to discuss is NBC News royal commentator and talk TV presenter Daisy McAndrew. Daisy, good morning. Let's talk about the dress code here. A little more relaxed in an effort to look more modern, of course, with the exception yeah. of the king, senior royals, of course. Hard to look casual in a crown. Right. <laughs> Walk us through some of the major fashion moments from the event. Well, funny enough, you say that the king looked formal, but the king traditionally should have been wearing breeches and stockings, so he did ditch them for something a little more modern. But it's the queen I want to start with. She was wearing this stunning Bruce Oldfield dress, but the thing that you couldn't see when you first looked at her was the fact that right at the bottom of the dress were two little embroidered Jack Russell dogs, and that was because of her beloved rescue dogs, uh, Beth and Bluebells, and she also had the names of her grandchildren embroidered into the dress. So you could see there that they really wanted to bring in the family, canine or human, into the fashion. Then, of course, if we move on to the queen in waiting, if you like, to Kate, wearing that stunning McQueen dress. And again, talking about formality, she was very formal because the king and queen had said that they wanted both William and Kate to wear their full regal regalia. So over the dress, the McQueen dress, she was wearing her royal garter order uh, robes. And that really, in a way, set her apart. It made her... Um, look much more like a queen in waiting. Well, speaking of fashion, let's talk about what the American First Lady, Jill Biden, she attended the coronation with her granddaughter, dressed in the colors of Ukraine's flag, blue and yellow. Should we assume that was not a coincidence? 
personally, I don't think any of these things are ever a coincidence. If you think that you spot a message, you probably have spotted a message. It was very notable that there she was in this beautiful Ralph Lauren blue outfit with Finnegan, her granddaughter, in buttercup yellow. And in fact, many people were making the, the observation that the centre of Westminster Abbey had these yellow and blue carpets. Now, in fact, that was coincidental because they're the traditional coronation colours. But I think there was clearly a message there. Interesting also to see First Lady Jill Biden spending a lot of time with our Prime Minister's wife, Rishi Sunak's wife. She was out at a, at a, a street party yesterday handing food out. So there's clearly some friendship forming there. We only have about 30 seconds left, but what did you make of Prince Harry not having a formal role in the ceremony, but at least being there in support of his father? It really was a blink and you miss it. He was at Heathrow Airport before the King had even made it back here to Buckingham Palace. Hmm. We do know that at the informal lunch afterwards, the King toasted his grandchildren, including Archie, on his fourth birthday, even though Harry wasn't there. All right, Daisy McAndrew, we're seeing some uh, little chats that Harry's having, you know, in that third row there with some of his family members. But um, folks were keeping a close eye on every little move throughout, even though there wasn't a lot to, <laughs> to take in. Exactly. Daisy, All right. thank you. And that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.